Squid Games has managed to completely obliterate all expectations, comingly seemingly out of nowhere to become one of the surprise pop culture phenomenons of 2021, blazing its way forward with numbers so big that the usually reclusive Netflix revealed that over 111 million people watched the Korean drama and it has reached number one spot in over 90 countries, beating other original series like Stranger Things and the recent hit Bridgerton to become the most watched show on Netflix. Squid Games is something rare and unique. It's not often that something completely unknown comes out of nowhere and becomes an all-encompassing hit. People began clamoring for the Squid Games guard costumes, Dalgana candy, and of course, numerous tributes and parodies that saturated the internet. The Korean drama captured the attention of the world and now holds a grip tightly on the consciousness of everyone, but Squid Games isn't unique. Fans of the world of Asian cinema are more than familiar with the concept of a battle royale death game. We've seen it in numerous other series, like of course the original GOAT, Battle Royale, Kaiji, Alice in Borderland, Danganronpa, Future Diary, Platinum End, As the Gods Will, and I guess the not-so-Asian Belko experiment and Hunger Games. What made it such a tremendous hit that it turned a genre usually only enjoyed by weebs like me into something mainstream enough to be featured in an SNL skit with Pete Davidson? There are a lot of things that made Squid Games exceptional and rapturing, and the one thing I haven't seen anyone else talk about is how well the games are designed to build narrative tension that keeps the audiences enraptured and engaged. So today, we're going to take a little moment to do a deep dive to appreciate the games of Squid Game and look at how they serve as the ultimate binge-worthy narrative tools. Of course, spoilers are coming. I mean, I don't know why you'd be watching this anyway if you haven't seen Squid Games already. So the death game, it's a great storytelling tool because you can take a random group of characters, slowly see them whittled away as they compete in a dystopian or supernatural game where the stakes are at the absolute highest. Squid Games has several iconic things that help it stand out from the pack in comparison to its contemporaries. It's got the PlayStation guards in pink jumpsuits. It's got the contestants in their green tracksuits with numbers. We got the sick, twisted, fluorescent colored playground interior that feels like it came from an MC Escher drawing, along with the sleepaway camp bunk beds. The front man mask, which seems like it was tailor made for those do not call blank at 3 a.m. videos that children seem to love on YouTube. The actual purpose behind the Squid Games is actually pretty predictable despite how mysterious and secret of the proceedings are. Evil rich people who in their opulence and wealth want to bet and watch poor desperate people be killed and die for their amusement. Despite the mystery of who's behind the games themselves being kind of obvious, most people don't care just because the series has enough instantly iconic imagery to make it feel wholly distinct from its spiritual predecessors. The other big element of Squid Game that separates it from its contemporaries is that all of the players are given an out, a way to get out of the games by voting to end it all. And after the first red light, green light game, they are free to escape the games, a situation few other characters are given in these kind of stories. But most come back because in their heart of hearts, they know the reason they were even recruited in the first place was because they were so destitute and so desperate, that the only means they have left of finding out a way out of their various predicaments is either death or squid game. So out of the 201 players who survived the red light, green light, 187 return, equaling a high 93% return rate. This little screenwriting device is a very similar to the one used in Breaking Bad, where Walter White gets an out for free cancer treatment, but his pride won't let him take it. He's seen how awful the world of meth dealing is, but he still presses forward because the beast of his own selfishness pushes him onward. The beast of greed and desperation brings the participants back, so in some ways, they are complicit in their own downfall and doom. The first two games work great because they lull the audience into a false sense of security. Squid Games gives you the fantasy of earning a huge amount of money for playing a few games, but what they don't tell you is that the games are designed to whittle 456 players down to one. If everyone knew the nature of how the games were designed, they'd never agree to participate, but it's this desperation and greed that gets them to go on. The logic is that red light, green light is only lethal if you don't follow the rules. If you keep a steady pace, you can make it unlike the other people who are slaughtered. The Dalgana candy is also an individual sport where those people with seemingly enough patience can conceivably make it out alive as long as they keep their focus. Of course, those candies break super easily as demonstrated by a million YouTube challenge videos, but on a surface level, 
feels doable, and it's an individual contest that can be won through patience and skill. The fact that all the main cast of characters make it through the challenges reinforces the confidence that all the challenges are beatable and fair. But the dynamic completely flips in the third game. This is the one where the contestants are forced to murder each other. Well, technically the lights out battle that happens at night is where they're first pitted against each other. But let's face it, I blame that all on the douchey gangster guy, and that's not technically a game with a rule set. But the tug of war is when they are forced to make teams and kill each other in competition, where failure means plunging towards your miserable crushing death. It's here where the squid game contestants are forced to fight each other instead of risking being shot to death by one of the pink PlayStation guards. This is a great narrative twist. As an audience, we're already curious to find out what the next game will be, but this changes up the format entirely. Now we have teams being formed where the value is placed on strength. This also builds up to the next reveal of the next game that will follow after, because mutual cooperation is assumed to be a good thing. You want a strong team, you don't want a weak partner to hold you back, and the third game shows the consequence of not having a good team. It's also scary that in the first two games, it was a solo competition where you would live and die by your own efforts. But with the tug of war, your survival isn't determined by your own choices, which makes an already terrifying game even worse, because at least before you lived and died based on your own skill. This twist of players competing in a task to compete to murder each other twists the knife, keeping viewers enthralled. Not to mention how well the tug of war is filmed, giving our team the biggest disadvantage, only having a last minute save in what is probably the greatest Netflix end screen cliffhanger of all time. The tug of war is an especially cool and cruel set piece where the contestants are now put in a position to murder each other directly through the games. This leads to an even greater twist when we get to the fourth game, the marble game, is genius not because it's mechanically interesting, but because it uses the bias of assuming all teams would work in mutual cooperation against each other. But that cooperation is now the greatest trap. As people team up, they have the horrible realization that rather than working with their teammate, they are competing to kill them and ensure their own survival. This leads to some of the richest tension as Cho Sang Wu starts out losing and then uses the trust Ali has for him to deceive and betray him in one of the cruelest, meanest moments in the entire series. It's great stuff, a truly effective example of subverting expectations for an emotionally wrenching gut punch that pays off and showcases the true cruelty and horror of the Squid Games. Not to mention that Song Ji Hun being put into a position where he deceives what he believes to be an old man with dementia for his own survival, as we discover how far he's willing to go to ensure his own survival. It's a gripping twist that works exceptionally well thanks to all the strong character building seen previously, and probably one of my favorite things I've seen in quite a while. And the Marvel game is easily one of the best standout moments from the entire series, even if it isn't quite as viral or memorable as Red Light, Green Light, or the Dalgana Candy. The fifth game is the Glass Bridge game, and this one, in my opinion, is easily the cruelest. The Glass Bridge takes any semblance of skill out of the equation. It's the kind of game that if anyone knew they'd be playing, they would have stayed out of the Squid Games entirely. Sure, Tug of War has you dragging people to their deaths. The Marble game has you betraying the person you trust most, but there's skill and strategy that can be applied to both of those. You can win with wit and skill. There is no skill or strategy here in this game. This is just Minesweeper, a demented game of memory and luck where the only way to win is to pick a high enough number so you don't have to go first. It's almost like a live action version of the Hall of Memory skit from Robot Chicken. Charles, are you ready to enter the Hall of Memory? I am! Then let's play! So, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Hi, I'm Q, and uh, I don't want to play anymore. <laughs> you get on in there. Way to use your memory. You remembered that error. Well, the best you could do was watch the path forward be made by the corpses of the few remaining contestants, which of course leads to a great drama as various people decide they don't necessarily want their bodies to be used to make a path forward. It's scary because you don't have any semblance of control. It's not the most strategic game, but it is a wonderfully mean and cruel way to see how many people can be forced to face their own mortality in a 50-50 split. The final game is the titular Squid Game itself, and it's also my least favorite. It's less a game as much as a bare-knuckle brawl between the ideological opposites of Song Ji Hun and Cho Sang Wu, where Ji Hun believes that they should morally oppose the game and end everything as a way to fight against the system where Song Wu believes in doing whatever it takes to get ahead, even if it means he must throw his friends and rivals into the proverbial glass plates. 
The two ideologies battle directly and get into a brutal fist fight with steak knives, and it's to me the least interesting game, but it serves as the climax of one of the core themes of the series, even if it cheaps out by having Sang Woo kill himself so Ji Hun can win the money by default without being complicit in the murder to win the game's final stage. And there you have what makes Squid Game's game so compelling. Because it's interesting there have been so many death games. Hell, a little less than a year ago there was Alice in Borderland, which was also released on Netflix, but none of them have had the same impact as Squid Game. But a big part of it, alongside the strong writing direction and art design, is the innate drama inherent in each of the games, and that's what's made Squid Game into one of the most bingeable series. And even if the intense shooting of Squid Game caused series creator and showrunner Huang Dong Hyuk to lose six of his teeth, I think it'll be more stressful to recreate the success of the first season with new games that are just as compelling from a storytelling perspective as the majority of the original six. But whenever Squid Game Season 2 drops, I'm curious to see how he'll approach the challenge of a follow-up. But I hope I've given you a monochrome of insight into what you loved so much about Squid Games. And if you haven't seen it, maybe understand why so many other people love it so much. If you're already a Squid Game K-pop stan, for the love of God, please go watch Kaiji. It's the same shit, and honestly, I think it's just as entertaining as anything seen in Squid Game, with even more drama and deathly gambling games played for the entertainment of evil rich people. Hope you enjoyed that look at what makes the games of Squid Game so great. I'd like to take a moment to give a special thank you to my own set of personal VIPs. They may not be evil billionaires who bet on desperate Koreans fighting it out in a death game for their own amusement, but they are the billionaires of my heart. By using their funds to support me in my own personal Squid Game as I fight an ever-losing battle against the YouTube algorithm. Watch out, Mr. Beast. I'm coming for you. I'm just 74 million subs away from catching up. But they are the people who help me make the content you stumble across occasionally on your YouTube homepage. And they are Joseph Malti, Aaron Tony, Carla Hoffman, Walking the Steps, Bari, Shonen Ronan, and Eric Duhane. Thank you. To me, your dollars are worth the millions that the VIPs use to bet on poor Koreans. Thank you for betting on me. You can join them by supporting my Patreon. Hope you enjoyed the video, and see you whenever my next one is ready.